which is going to be on climate change and outbreak preparedness. Uh, I'm very sure this is going to be very interesting. So, Jimmy, please. Well, thank you very much for that kind of introduction, uh, Umberto, and um, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a privilege to be able to speak to you at this important conference. Now, as Umberto says, I'm going to be talking about planetary health, climate change, and outbreak preparedness, particularly in Africa. And I show this uh, picture here, and the point I want to make is that we've always been vulnerable to outbreaks of infectious diseases, and Noah is right to be concerned about the situation that he finds himself in here. He's in a very crowded environment, um, the humans there are right next to lots of other animals, and he has birds in close proximity as well. And if those birds are to get sick, then the chance of them all becoming sick with something serious is very high. A good example of this would be SARS which is severe acute respiratory syndrome, which was the first outbreak of a large scale that we saw in the 21st century. This arose in China in 2002, and through international air travel, very quickly spread around the globe. It was a novel virus pathogen, it was a coronavirus, and it was spread by respiratory droplets. There was an animal reservoir, and worldwide, during this outbreak, there were over 8,000 cases and more than 700 deaths. And um, the, the cost of this outbreak um, was uh, estimated to be somewhere between 10 and 30 billion dollars to be able to control it. So the difference between uh, the number of cases that there were and actually the disruption that this caused was, was huge. And that's an important point to keep in mind. And the other thing, I think, is look at what happened with SARS and the characteristics here and look at what the similarities are with the current unfolding situation in Wuhan uh, at the moment. I'm sorry, let me stop. Uh, Okay, sorry about that. So, if we think more broadly about outbreaks and the emergence of infections, what are the major drivers that lead these things to happen? People tend to think that microbial adaptation or change, some way that there's a mutation in a, in a microbe, is, uh, is the thing that causes this to happen. Well, it can be, and that happens sometimes, but there's lots of other factors that are equally important. Ecological changes, changes in land use and development, climate and climate change are all potent drivers of uh, outbreaks occurring, and of course these are all related to climate change and planetary health. International travel and commerce, 
uh, helps to spread these outbreaks around the world very quickly. Direct human activities, things like technology, uh, agriculture, are important. Human populations, which, as I'll show you, uh, are increasing in a way that means that we have much more crowding, urbanization, and the elements of poverty related to that are important. On top of that, human behavior uh, is, is an element here. Um, we as humans, in most countries in the world, don't always do what we're told, and that often can lead to the spread of outbreaks. Immunosuppression can be important. Um, if you think about diseases like HIV, that changes the, um, the infections that are around in uh, the uh, population. So we see outbreaks of tuberculosis occurring and upsurges caused by that immunosuppression. Public health measures, if they break down, that means that we no longer have the protection that we expect. And then humanitarian crises and conflicts and wars are also potent drivers of emergence of infections. So there's elements here which you can group into sort of biological, human, and then environmental, often related to, to uh, planetary health that are relevant here. And I'm going to talk about some of those drivers. One is population growth. What we see with this is more overcrowding, we see more urbanization, and um, Andy Haynes yesterday was talking about the importance of uh, healthy, livable cities for people to be able to, to live in. Um, that's very important because there are great challenges. If you've got lots of people somewhere, then to be able to provide safe sanitation for all those people, as well as water supply, um, things like landfills for waste that develops, or energy consumption to allow people to uh, actually light their homes, cook their food, heat themselves, all become important. And then land usage, particularly to uh, provide food for the people who are in those cities, all become major challenges and affect the environment around. Here's a picture of the UN world population estimates. And what we see here are three pie charts. And the, the first one here uh, from 1950 shows a world population of two and a half billion people. By the year 2000, that's grown to six billion. And by 2050, that's expected to have grown to almost nine billion. Now, another thing I'd like you to look at is that the segment of this population that is related to Africa is this pale blue here, which, as you can see, is growing and growing faster as a proportion of the overall world population uh, than any of the other uh, continents. So what we are seeing is that the population in Africa is growing faster than the, the average and Africa is going to become e increasingly crowded over the next few decades. Poverty is also an important uh, determinant because this makes populations vulnerable to infections. About three quarters of a billion people live in extreme poverty, about equally spread between Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And then there are some two billion people who are suffering from undernutrition or malnutrition uh, or a lack of basic health care or access to clean water. And so all of these people are vulnerable to infections. We place on top of that the fact we're in an increasingly interconnected world with increasing international travel, and it is estimated that some two million people cross an international border every day. So the idea that you might be able to insulate one country from what is happening in the rest of the world is pure fantasy. Not just people who are moving, um, agricultural products, 
and animals are also moving around the world at an increasing rate and because we share so many pathogens with animals this again raises the risks of outbreaks and them spreading fast. Now if you've got a good public health system you don't notice it. The measure of success of a good public health system is silence. Nothing happens. You only really notice public health systems when they go wrong. And what happens when they go wrong? Well, you get failures in surveillance and response to um, outbreaks that may occur. And this allows for the re-emergence of diseases that have been controlled. For example, if sanitation fails, there's a risk of cholera. If it's vector control that fails, maybe it's trypanosomiasis. Um, we have seen in many countries with complacency that tuberculosis was controlled an upsurge because we took our eye off controlling it. And then non-compliance for things like vaccine controllable diseases such as measles and polio are also um, examples of things that uh, we can get upsurges if there's a breakdown in public health systems. This graph that I show here um, is actually cases of diphtheria and this was what happened in the USSR when that broke down uh, uh, into uh, Russia and the, the federal states. There was a big outbreak of diphtheria and that was the first time that had been seen in a developed country in 50 years. Now, when you get a breakdown in public health systems, not only do you then get an increased risk of outbreaks, but it discourages the population from presenting because they don't think anything will happen at the health services if they were to turn up and that undermines any response that is made to an outbreak. Wars contribute to breakdown in infrastructure, that, populate, that public health uh, infrastructure that I mentioned before, but also there will be large population movements associated with that. That might be armies, that might be refugees. And historically, both armies and refugees are affected severely by outbreaks. Recent examples that I'll say a bit more about both of these later on is a big outbreak of cholera that we've seen recently in the Yemen and the ongoing uh, outbreak of Ebola in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Now in terms of climate change, some of the effects of this that we see that are relevant for uh, outbreaks are changes in food production that need to be made because of changes in climate, loss of agricultural land, encroachment of populations into wild habitats where they will come into contact with uh, other uh, mammalian species which may uh, give them uh, exposure to other uh, pathogens. Migration of people going to places where they are able to actually um, uh, fend for themselves and temperature and climate generally can affect vectors and their distribution and so we can see that malaria and dengue can expand their range into areas where they weren't previously seen because of increasing temperature. <laughs> now, yesterday, um, Andy Haynes talked about the great acceleration, and I want to, to, to return to this theme. And here are a set of um, six graphs that show you rapid overconsumption of human populations. And for each of the graphs, um, it, is, it is showing you from 1900 through 1950 to 2000 and to 2010. And <coughs> this shows us um, water use rising and rising, transportation rising and really accelerating, um, fertilizer use for agriculture rising here, paper production, plastic production 
and uh, primary energy use here. So all of these things you see are increasing and there's no sign of any of these actually slowing down, plateauing or falling. They're all continuing to go up. So globally we are continuing to overconsume. Now this has led to uh, the concept of the human global footprint and what this does is it looks at how much of the resources, the bioresources of the earth that we have, we use as a population in one year. And it then compares that to the amount of natural regeneration that there could be of that resource over that same period. And the red line here shows you equilibrium. That shows you what would happen if we, or shows you where we would be if we were at a sustainable level of using the finite resources that we have on our planet. And as you can see, ever since the early 1970s, we have been overconsuming. And that overconsumption is continuing to rise. And uh, in 2019, reached 170%, which means we're using 70% more resources than are actually available to be regenerated. What is referred to as the overshoot day, the day in the calendar year at which time we've used up all the resources that would be available sustainably, for last year, that was the 29th of July. After that, we were going into debt. We can see the impact of this on a number of natural systems. So the first one here shows you um, degradation of, uh, of uh, the biosphere. And this essentially is looking at the loss of species around the world. And as you can see, this is also increasing. Marine fish capture is shown here. Uh, this has risen, as you can see, very sharply, but it has then plateaued here. Well, why is it plateaued? It's plateaued because we've caught all the fish. It would go up if we had more fish to catch, but they're simply not there anymore. Um, then we have uh, carbon dioxide, which you see rising and accelerating up here. The acidification of the oceans continuing to rise, and um, also uh, tropical forest loss here. So all these measures that we're looking at show how we have really depleted the natural systems around the world. And the conclusion from that is that we're heading towards catastrophe, that we are continuing and we're not slowing down in over-consuming and damaging the national resources that are here. And indeed, the Rockefeller Foundation and Lancet Commission on Planetary Health in 2015 said that we've been mortgaging the health of future generations to realize the economic and development gains in the present. So in other words, we are damaging the future by looking for progress that's unsustainable today. So if we put that scenario against what we're seeing with epidemics, then we have a situation where epidemics are by their nature unpredictable and the burden that they may cause uh, can be very wide ranging. So for example, the West African Ebola outbreak cost $3.6 billion to control, which incidentally is three times the annual budget for WHO. Um, and also, at the same time, the economic losses for the three countries affected was $2.2 billion. But there will be a significant impact just if there's a threat of an outbreak. There don't even need to be any cases. The disruption and the cost uh, will still be there. And indeed, like with SARS, this may be unrelated to the morbidity burden. 
So in the West African Ebola outbreak, um, there were fewer cases, there were fewer deaths from Ebola than there were deaths from measles or malaria or maternal deaths. And that's because of the damage that was caused to the health systems just by having the Ebola outbreak in the country. So it's a much wider direct effect than just the uh, outbreak itself. We're better at doing surveillance than we were before, but that means we get more false alarms of uh, outbreaks that actually are not going to come. That variation in potential of whether they will cause uh, any problems in the population makes it very difficult for planners to determine how much resource to put against something like this. But communication and risk assessment is absolutely essential to be able to uh, bring along uh, the policymakers and the general public. And what we often see is a mixture of complacency and then overreaction. So we get people who don't bother to get vaccinated against diseases like measles that they think may have gone away. But then when there's an outbreak, there's a panic and everybody rushes to get their children uh, vaccinated. Now, what did we see with Ebola in, in West Africa? This was the largest outbreak that was ever recorded. There were more than 28,000 cases, more than 11,000 deaths. And both the national authorities and WHO were slow to respond to this outbreak. The international health regulations, which are supposed to be there to keep us all safe, did not help in this case. And the international response and research associated it with were both very slow to actually scale up to the, uh, to the levels needed to do this. And I've mentioned the costs uh, associated with controlling this outbreak. So that was a very slow response that happened there. Now, at the moment, we have an outbreak of Ebola in the eastern uh, DRC. This has been going on since August of 2018. There's over 3,400 cases and over 2,200 deaths at the moment. In this case, almost a quarter of a million people have been vaccinated. Now, what happened on this occasion was that DRC is always on high alert for Ebola. It has had um, uh, around 10 outbreaks in the past, and this is where they normally occur. But what happened on this occasion was, although cases started to occur in the east of the country, those local reports did not reach the national authorities in Kinshasa for months. Once those reports did reach the national authority, then they acted very fast, and indeed the international response was very fast. But a lot of time had been lost because this had not got uh, to Kinshasa, the information at the first place. Coupled with that, we have poor security in this area. There's more than 100 armed militia that operate in this part of DRC. There's been a long-standing humanitarian crisis for over 20 years, and almost half a million people are displaced in the area. So it's not surprising that there's community suspicion of any authorities that are coming in, um, and particularly they're suspicious of why they've been ignored for 20 years, and now suddenly people are coming to them and very interested. And this is a difficult area to work in, so the logistics of actually getting here is tough as well. So this is almost a worst case scenario here, that you've got a really serious outbreak occurring in somewhere that's difficult to get to, it's insecure, and there's a humanitarian crisis occurring at the same time. We would all love to be able to predict where and when the next outbreak might happen and what it might be. I don't know. I can tell you there's going to be another outbreak, but I don't know what, where, or, or when. Although sometimes it's obvious as things start to evolve that this might happen. And an example would be cholera in Yemen that's occurred recently. There have been more than a million cases of cholera that have occurred. And this is in a vulnerable population, and this could be predicted. There's a civil war that's going on. 
There are airstrikes on the hospitals. There's a poor water supply and sanitation. And the public health service hasn't been funded there since uh, 2016. So you've got, again, a perfect situation for an outbreak to develop and for it to be very hard to control. But what can we do to try to uh, predict what is going to happen? Well, there's a lot of what's called an epidemic intelligence, where at global level we look to see where there are clusters of diseases that are occurring. And things like ProMed, HealthMap, GFIN, GoOn, um, the uh, uh, ProMed, uh, WHO, all uh, have systems for looking at what is occurring around the world. And in fact, uh, this system is such that WHO receives something like 3,000 signals every month around the world of clusters of diseases that they need to keep under evaluation. That's at the global level. But... The really important thing is that the response has to start locally. The rate limiting factor for preventing the spread of an infectious disease isn't that international outbreak response. It's actually what happens at the front line. It's what happens in the communities and the countries that are at risk. And when I talk about the people at the front line, these are the people who are at the front line, and these are the people that we need to rely on to be able to control epidemics. And if that's going to happen, there needs to be trust. There needs to be trust both ways between uh, these people here and the authorities in the Ministry of Health. There needs to be engagement on both sides and also investment uh, to make sure that these people here have what they need and the reassurance to be able to control outbreaks. Now, if they do that, then you need a national uh, health system that is able actually to support a response. When we had the West Africa Ebola outbreak, Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea had some of the weakest health systems in the world. And because infectious diseases don't recognise any borders, that means that's a global weakness and all of us are vulnerable because of those weak health services that we see elsewhere. And health system strengthening needs to be a priority uh, all around the world if we're going to have uh, uh, security, health security for the, for the future. Now, the um, international health regulations that I show there uh, is a booklet that I'll, I'll say a little bit more in a, in a few moments, but this is the sort of primer for how we provide that protection. And then the joint external evaluation is a tool that is used to monitor and evaluate how well prepared uh, countries are to be able to uh, uh, respond to, to outbreaks. And in West Africa, that Joint external evaluation is supported with funding from the G7 and the World Bank through the REDIS program. On top of that, there are rapid response teams and global reservists, and some of those are international, but perhaps more importantly, national uh, rapid response teams are taking off in, at country level in a number of different places. Uh, Nigeria, DRC, Sudan, South Africa, even Indonesia now have international rapid support teams that are, that are set up and ready to go when outbreaks occur. Now, let's have a look at how well prepared um, Sub-Saharan Africa actually is. Now, WHO say that there's still a lot to do in the African region. And when I show you the pictures, you'll see why. Um, and that there's really no single country or organization that can do this by this themselves. And strong partnerships are necessary if we're going to have uh, health protection around the region. Here's a map that shows you African health security in the global context. All those circles there are events. And the bigger they are and the more red they are, the more serious they are. And what you can see is that they occur in most parts of the world, but the area where you really see a lot of these are across this uh, equatorial belt here 
in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is the area where most of the outbreaks in the world are occurring. And at the Afro WHO office, which looks at sub-Saharan Africa, they are getting reports of over 100 health emergencies reported each year. And as you can see from that graph on the, or that map on the left, all countries in the region are at risk. On the right is a random example of a weekly bulletin that WHO AFRO put out that uh, shows you what outbreaks they are following at any one time. So this week in February 2019, they were following 61 events on the African continent, of which 51 were outbreaks and 10 were humanitarian crises. So this is something that is happening all the time. Um, and it's a question really for WHO of being able to identify which are the top priorities that need attention. The international health regulations, as I mentioned, this is a global health security framework. This is supposed to prevent, protect, and provide a public health response for all public health threats, not just for uh, outbreaks, although it is largely used in that context. Now, within that, there's this uh, joint external evaluation, and there are 19 different technical areas that teams come in and evaluate for um, different uh, countries. And um, at the bottom there, there's a sort of a bit of a summary. So the things that countries in Africa are best at is immunization, surveillance, and having national laboratory systems. That's a strength for around 40% of the countries in the region. But national legislation, financing, um, uh, coordination is weak throughout the region. And there's a long list of the major gaps here. And look at this, these are big things. Antimicrobial resistance, biosecurity, preparedness, emergency response, medical countermeasures, which means diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines, um, personnel deployment, points of entry, chemical events and radiation emergencies. All of these are seen as major gaps in the region. This is a scorecard, if you like, for uh, uh, how well countries are ready to prevent outbreaks from occurring. Um, if you're green, you're very good. Nowhere's green. If you're uh, yellow, then you're fairly well um, uh, organized. And if you're red, then you're not organized at all. Okay, and you can see large areas, um, including in West Africa, where there really is no real uh, capacity to prevent outbreaks from occurring. If we look at detection, things are much better. Um, nearly everywhere is yellow here. Um, there's really only two countries there that are uh, red. But if we move to how well people are ready to respond to outbreaks, then there's an awful lot of red there. And um, the areas that are yellow are largely in East Africa, although uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, um, from their previous experiences, uh, Senegal too, are uh, actually pretty well prepared. So overall, if you put all that together and look at the global context, this is a preparedness index by country for the world. Um, if you're green or, or pale blue, then you're doing pretty well. If you're yellow, then you're doing reasonably. If you're brown, then you need to do better. You need to buck up, buck up. you need to uh, really improve what you're doing. And if you're red, then you're in a really serious situation. The only places that are red here are CAR, South Sudan, and, and Somalia. So um, 
that gives some reassurance. But you can see sub-Saharan Africa overall, that's the biggest block of brown that we are seeing in the continent. So that question there, are we prepared? What do you think? No, not at all. OK, so we're not well prepared, but there are some examples where we're doing reasonably well, I would say, and that is on the sharing of resources. WHO have set up a laboratory network for emerging and dangerous pathogens, which is pretty successful. There are north-south collaborations between people like the UK Public Health Rapid Support Team, south-south collaborations, with things like Africa CDC, global cooperation with, uh, the, with GOAN, which is the Global Outbreak and Alert Response Network. There are coordinated joint activities, things like WAHO play an important role in this area, and multi-sector engagements need to be encouraged, things for a One Health approach, so where we get the animal health involved as well as the human health. Information sharing and innovation, important, and investing in, in research. Um, and Umberto mentioned my role uh, working with the WHO Research and Development Blueprint. This is actually looking to see how we can stimulate more work on diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines for these outbreak diseases. Some examples. Um, the plague outbreak in Madagascar, the response to that was uh, pretty good, actually. WHO got involved fairly early on at around this stage when cases were starting to occur and when the upsurge came they provided uh, large numbers of uh, antibiotic treatments uh, that enabled the outbreak to, to come under control. Um, then there was yellow fever in Angola and DR Congo um, which uh, was very worrying and a big surge there. But with the provision of um, 11 million uh, vaccinations in Angola and at least 2 million in DRC, this was uh, able to be, be controlled, although it did deplete the world supply of, uh, of uh, yellow fever vaccination. Now, an important message is that research has to be part of the response that we have here. It has to be integral here. This is how we learn how to do things better. Also, a lot of the interventions that we need to use in outbreaks can only be fully evaluated when an outbreak is occurring. You can't look at therapeutics for things like Marburg or Ebola unless there are cases of Marburg and Ebola that are occurring. The WHO R&D blueprint for action that I've mentioned was established in 2016, and this is one way to actually coordinate those activities. And I think we are slowly getting some mind change uh, in, in uh, what people are doing here. So we now have an Ebola vaccine that was rapidly developed and was tested during an outbreak. This has now been used in three outbreaks. Uh, that figure's out of date. It's about a quarter of a million people have been vaccinated in the current outbreak. But it's not an ideal vaccine. About 50% of people who get it get a fever, and another 50% get arthralgia, pain in their, their joints that persists for some time. So we need a better vaccine than that. Um, we've had randomized controlled trials of Ebola therapeutics, and the PALM trial in, in DRC have shown us which are the best therapeutics to be used in uh, this situation. And even if you can't do a randomized controlled trial, then uh, compassionate use, something that's called MURI, which is this monitored emergency use, can also be used for experimental therapeutics. And this has been used in some 700 people in DRC. And then modern technologies, the use of real-time sequencing and things like gene expert for diagnosis are increasingly being used in outbreaks as well. So research is starting to improve what happens. But we still have a situation where outbreak preparedness and response puts an extra demand on already weak health systems. 
which means there's late detection and there are issues with uh, infection prevention and control and this can lead to amplification of cases uh, if they come into hospital and you don't have good control measures. The working in conflict affected areas with insecurity, limited access, destroyed systems also makes this really hard and the limited investment so far in research in documenting what happened and learning lessons from what happened in previous outbreaks are all things which aren't happening as much as they should be. Now, those key messages that I mentioned earlier on, they're still the same, just to re-emphasize those. But thinking for the future, we need better methods to be able to anticipate where disease threats and hotspots are, are going to occur. And I think we know, actually, reasonably well where are the vulnerable places, and that's where we need to put a lot of our resources. We need a solid flow of information on suspect cases. We need preparation and training between outbreaks and funding so that we can have fast and effective responses. As you can see, that's really not the case for almost every country in sub-Saharan Africa. And we need to build that frontline capacity and the public health systems for a national response. We can't rely on an international response. That can support, but it has to be led by a national response. And we need better tools we need interventions, and research can play an important part of that. And if you think about that and what the future needs, and you think about what the effects of climate change and planetary health are in actually making all of these jobs harder, you can see that we still have a long way to go. Thank you. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, Jimmy, for this uh, very informative <clears throat> presentation. What I take from here is the most important point for me is that there's the need of a national response, absolutely essential partnership, and also research. Now, I'm going to uh, allow two questions or comments, because we are a bit late. So who wants to, I got a, uh, uh, hands here. Okay, I'm going to do it myself. T um, thank, uh, thank you very much. I'm from here to Jean Pierre from the University of Antwerp, the Global Health Institute. I have a question because the issue is that everything is about health systems, surveillance uh, that we know fast. And there is a discrepancy for me that everything with health systems belongs to national authorities. And the financial streams are coming from national authorities who in one or other way have to find the resources through different uh, systems. But once it becomes an emergency or if something, then it's international money. And I think there's a huge discrepancy here because the resources that should prevent or detect are national, but then when we have a problem, it suddenly becomes international. And then international, there are a lot of resources, and if you see what we spent after <laughs> when something happens, and if that money would have been used on, for, on national levels, uh, then we wouldn't have had the problem. So isn't there a way of thinking that's coming that healthcare and health systems is in fact, in our globalized world, an international good and not a national good anymore? Uh, and that financing that we should use international solidarity to finance health systems uh, to prevent also. Uh, and I guess this is a rhetorical question, but please, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what's the way, what's going on? And that's, uh, that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do agree with you. Um, what I would add to that is that it's not like it is just, it's a local response or bang, it's an international response. There is a gradation. WHO have a, a, a system of grades and they will look at the severity of what happens and they will assess whether 
they feel a country should be managing it by themselves. And it is, at the end of the day, the national authority's responsibility to look after their population that they have, or whether they need to provide some assistance or a lot of assistance, or whether they need to go in in a big way. Um, and it may look as though, at international level, there are lots of resources, but there aren't really. Um, and WHO are constantly worrying that the plans that they have, even for DRC, they've got about enough money for another four weeks, another six weeks, or so on, and so they also have a worry there. But overall, there does need to be more commitment to this if we want to keep the planet safe. Thank you. Any? Yes? Please tell your name and affiliation. Good morning, everybody. I am Saini, representing Extinction Rebellion Gambia. So my question is, in your presentation, you talked about the international community respond. Who did, they didn't respond. So why didn't they respond? And also, last year, the cyclone that struck Mozambique, that killed 1,000 people and displaced many, um, the IMF just loaned Mozambique instead of them trying to, 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 to talk about the climate and ecological emergency, they loaned Mozambique, which is also a developing country. So uh, that is so hard, and how can those people repay that debt while they are trying to help those people that have been affected by the cycle in Ide? So general, my question is, why didn't they respond to the emergency? Thank you. Okay, Jimmy? Okay, I, I think the West Africa Ebola outbreak was a wake-up call for the whole uh, global community. We weren't prepared, we weren't ready to respond to a large-scale outbreak in the way that we should. And there was a lot of soul-searching that went on after that to ensure that that should not happen again, that it should not take three months to actually uh, scale up. Uh, uh, a response. So there was a lesson that was, was learned from there. Um, people could respond to small-scale outbreaks, but they really were not ready to respond to large-scale outbreaks. Um, as far as uh, the situation you're talking about in Mozambique, um, I think what usually happens with IMF loans is that they're what we call soft loans and they may never get paid, they may get deferred and so on. So you can almost think of it like uh, it's a donation that's come in in the first place. But perhaps added to that, um, the World Bank and WHO now both have schemes where if countries are having a crisis or having an outbreak, if they declare those, there are funds that are available immediately for them to be able to use to control those. And those are not loans, they are uh, simply paid as a sort of insurance, uh, off a sort of insurance policy to be able to respond to outbreaks. And that, that has been used, for example, in the DRC for the Ebola on, on uh, two occasions. So I think this is uh, a way that we might be able to get money quickly to countries to be able to respond to outbreaks in the future. Okay, the, the very, very last. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, my name is Mamaduba. I'm working at the MRC. Um, I want to ask this question with regards to the outbreak in Sierra Leone. We've learned lesson before the outbreak in Sierra Leone where we have intervention. Biomedical scientists come in with their ideas of controlling infectious diseases outbreak. And we've seen failure happening there because we are not sensitive to cultural, um, cultural awareness and all those kind of things and tra traditional practice. And we've seen again in Congo, we're still having the same problem because most of the resistance is because of lack of trust. And it seems like we're not still learning our mistakes in previous outbreak. What is your take on this? 
I think that's a very important point, and if I'd had more time, I'd have included that in my, my presentation, that understanding local context and understanding local perceptions are absolutely crucial to be able to control outbreaks. In my opinion, if you don't have community engagement and involvement, you can't control an outbreak. You have to have that. That's absolutely required. Um, there is increasing recognition of the importance of, of understanding the anthropology and social scientists' involvement in that, but it does seem to me that still that's largely lip service rather than is actually being included as much as it should be in what happens. So I think we still have some problems in DRC as a result of that. It's seen very much as an alien um, outside force that is coming in to deal with this and very little local involvement in, in what is what is happening, which would make it much more acceptable. So I think we've got a way to go, and I think you make an important point. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to stop here. Uh, I would like to thank Jimmy, and let give me a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Now, we have one, two, three, four, four presentations, each, each of them 15 minutes. So I would like to ask the speaker to make the presentation in 10 minutes so we have time for some question at the end. So the first one <clears throat> is Nombre Apollinaire. Uh, is it, is Nombre Apollinaire here? Yes, yes, he's here, okay, from Burkina Faso. Bonjour et bienvenue. <laughs> So, um, I think it's from Saint Muras, is it? No? Saint Muras? No. no. From Sinarapi. Oh, Sinarapi. So, Saint National Recherche et Formation Paludisme. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so thanks for being here. He's going to present using drones to characterize mosquito environments in Burkina Faso. Hi, everybody, and thank you very much for being there to listen to my presentation. I'm Nombre Apolline. I'm coming from Burkina Faso, working in CNRFP, a center for national diseases, especially in malaria. And I'm going to present you uh, this work uh, under direction of uh, scientists from London School and also scientists from uh, CNRFP. Uh, the topic is uh, using drone to characterize mosquito environments in uh, Burkina Faso. So first of all, um, let's say that uh, uh, malaria is still uh, one of the major issues in the country. So it's causing a lot of an, a lot of social and economic burden in the country. So it has high incidence despite widespread investment in control measures. In 2017, we registered up to 11 million malaria cases, and it's harmful. So the INDI project, the PFAS for infection dynamics and transmission and form elimination project was conducted in uh, Sapone. Sapone is a, a health and demographic surveillance system and it's not far from the main town, Ouagadougou. And uh, it has uh, two, 22 local health facilities covering up to 83 villages. So it's a good place to do researches. We have a small metro station where we can collect uh, temperature draining data, wind speed, humidity. But before we go through our topic, we have to go back in the previous studies and understand what happened in this area. So uh, the entomologist Galpego uh, did a previous study in this area. And it, it was not that uh, we have uh, a large variation in terms of number of mosquitoes bites 
both seasonally and uh, within compounds. So the graph A show you, show you the transmission season variation, while the B show you the variation between uh, compounds. So to understand uh, uh, which factors are influencing more the risk of malaria in this place, we're going to respond to two questions. The first one is, how does local environment affect household risk? And the next one is, how can we use aerial and satellite remote sensing data to characterize these risks? To do that, we collected two kinds of data. So we use drone imagery, and we also use, uh, we did uh, ground surveys. And here you can see uh, a drone imagery. And uh, we did here an auto mosaic and digital surface model. And below you can see the blue color show you the surface with, uh, let's say, low uh, altitude, while the red one shows the uh, high altitude. So the blue one can be uh, uh, it's a place where we can have water bodies. Next, um, with ground survey, we collected up to 300 water bodies, but most of them was aware containers and portals, with 47% positive for anophila, and this is very harmful. So what did we collect? We collect ceramic pots, uh, water uh, runoff, from water pump, we have cliche day uh, for chicken. And we also, you know, in the rural area in Sapone, when people want to build their house, they have to dig land and uh, dig the earth, take land, dig the bricks, and build the houses. And when rain comes, it's become water bodies. So we have tires, we have also well abandoned wells. The next year, we show you uh, a drone imagery uh, with, uh, this is a water body visible imagery. Here we have also water bodies visible in imagery. The mainly ceramic pots. The next we try to, we have tried to overlap uh, the compound involved in the project and uh, water bodies, GPS points, and water body visible in imagery. So the purple circle shows us um, the compounds involved in the, in the project. The water body, on the GPS water body, we have in yellow, we have in yellow, and uh, we have also the red one are showing you the, the, the water bodies with, uh, uh, without larva inside. While the, the green one shows us presence of low water body. So the water body visible in imagery are in yellow color. The next thing we have tried to do is to, cal to calculate the specificity of the drone. And here we got something very interesting. We've turned 22% of water bodies, but of course, limited detection of small containers or water bodies under uh, trees. So the next things to do was to, to incorporate multispectral imagery. So for that, we use uh, Sentinel data. Uh, you can see here that we use uh, from uh, December 2018 to February 2019. Uh, there is a large variation in terms of uh, vegetation and in terms of water body sizes. Here you have two pictures. The left one is from the dry season, while the right one is from the rainy season. So in conclusion, we can recommend drone for identifying large water bodies or view areas hard to access. Of course, there are limitations in identifying certain breeding sites. The next point is we note that larva, bat, larva Habitats are primarily man-made, so we have the transsensitized people. And the third point is the use of uh, aerial imagery uh, with multispectral camera. 
to develop better risk map because for this work we use something like data it will be easy to it will be very interesting to use also the imagery data with multispectral camera to do it i took advantage here to present you our network the macondo uh, network for the use of drone for malaria vector control you can have more information than the london website or you can contact me directly after the meeting or you can also contact uh, uh, Kalish Tashan, who is there, and uh, you will have more information. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, very good time. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, I think it's great to see that um, novel technology like the drones are used to map uh, uh, breeding sites for larvae, uh, the vector for malaria. We know Anopheles gambier it breeds in a very small pool of water, and that's what you are exactly showing that there are some pool, some breeding sites are not detectable by drones. Yeah. yeah. There's also some people actually that I remember that some people use drones to spray insecticide on over breeding sites. But anyway, so is there any uh, question? Yes, Jimmy. Thank you, very interesting. Uh, Jimmy Whitworth, London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine. Um, I'm interested in what the community and the security forces think about um, the use of um, uh, drones in this area and what sort of permissions were, were needed to be able to do this study. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Jim. Uh, to use drone in my country, especially in Burkina Faso, we have to have, we, we need three authorization from the Ministry of Defense, from the Ministry of Health, from the Ministry of, uh, with the, the, the Institute Geographic of uh, the National Geographic Institution. And uh, with these three authorization, authorization you, are, you have to go to the civilian aviation and they will provide you the final certificate to use drone, and they will show you the way you can use it. So it's very structured. Not very easy, not yeah. very easy. Yeah. Okay, yes, another question here. Uh, good morning, I am Omar Sisi from the National Environment Agency. I just wanted to find out uh, what was the uh, comparison between the ground routing after using the GPS coordinates and the drone itself. Thank Please you. come again. I said, I wanted to ask uh -huh. uh, the comparison. And the comparison. Yes, when you compare the ground routing, that's when you get to the field to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. use the GPS coordinates to get yeah. your points and the results of the drones. Thank you. Yeah, the, the best way uh, to, to see the, 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 the drone assessment or to calculate the specificity is to, to overlap with GPS points, uh, water bodies you detect vi uh, on the, with, the grand, with the drone imageries and to see if there are water bodies. That you, with the drone, you are able to, to look at those who are, what, who are water inside. Okay, and with the GPS point is direct, so you are on the ground, you may be able to see if there is water or not. So you, you just now compare the result from your visible for your interpretation of the imagery and what you have seen really in the, in the ground, so you can make the, the statistic and uh, the ratio. Yeah, he wants to ask what's the percentage of... The percentage, uh, here we found 62%, but maybe we, it's because we just took take uh, uh, 300, if maybe if you took more, we can get more interesting ratio. So 62 means that you were able to, f to identify 62% of water bodies with the drone? Yeah. It's okay? Okay, good. Uh, I think, thank you very much for this presentation. A round of applause. Okay, thank you very much. We go to the next presentation. Um, again, malaria. Very happy with, for that. Ayuwale Mayowa Marakino. Okay, good. 
um, I guess from Nigeria. He's going to talk about housing type and risk of malaria among under five children in Nigeria. My name is Oye Wale Maiwa Muraki from the University of Ibadan. I'm from the Department of Environmental and Sciences. And this morning, uh, my presentation is titled Housing Type and Risk of Malaria Among Under Five Children in Nigeria. Thank you very much. So like I said, my presentation is titled Housing Type and Risk of Malaria Among Under Five Children in Nigeria. You will agree with me that it is a known fact that the changing um, climate and weather patterns as a result of increase in temperature and rainfall humidity can also lead to the proliferation of you know, vector um, carrying um, vector borne diseases in our environment. And so Malaria is an ancient threat to human health and it remains the primary cause of morbidity and mortality you know, globally across across countries. In 2008, you know, from the World um, Malaria Report, it was reported that about 405,000 deaths was recorded as a, result, as a result of malaria infection. And within the African region, the African region was responsible for about 94% of the total global deaths that was attributed to malaria infections. And so children under five, the children that are, up, that are not up to five years, they are accounted for 67% of that total body. That shows the enormous uh, enormity of the malaria body that we have in our hands. If you look at this particular um, figure, you'll find that, that you know, it shows the percentage of estimated deaths for 21 countries. And so this country, these 21 countries accounted for about 55% of the total malaria deaths that was recorded in the year 20, in 2018. If you look at that particular um, chart, you see that Nigeria accounted for 24% of that particular debt. And so that shows that we need you know, newer interventions to complement what is already on ground so that the problem of malaria can really be solved. And so, if you also look at studies that have been done and you compare what we have with past studies, which it has been clearly shown that there is a reduction in the incidence of malaria that we have. So this can be attributed to various um, interventions that we put in place. For example, the use of long-lasting long cell treatment nets, the use of um, indoor residual spraying, the use of um, intermittent preventive therapy, and also control measures like the um, detections of, of malaria parasites using rapid um, diagnostic tests and also the use of actimacin combination therapies. All these have resulted in reducing the incidence of a malaria body that we are. But we find out that there are also additional you know, interventions that are needed because the various um, interventions that Helia mentioned are also being plagued with you know, one problem or the other. For example, the use of lung insecticide treatment lengths. There have been studies that have also been shown that you also find mosquitoes even within those long start and you know, long lasting um, insecticide nets. There are also instances of you know, mosquito being resistant to some of the residual you know, spray that people use. And so newer interventions and newer programs are coming of. One of those programs is the WHO Global Strategies for Malaria, which runs from 2016 to 2013. Another one is the, is the complementary rollback malaria. We also have the intersectoral, um, the, the intersectoral intervention to um, eradicate malaria between the year 2016 and 2018. The aim of all this program is to look at additional ways through which we can you know, eliminate malaria. And so one thing that stands out in this program is the desire to use housing 
you know, as a comp to complement the longest start in ancestral genetics and also the residual spirit that always been in use. And so the justification of this study, like earlier said, is to is that there's a compelling evidence that housing improvements enhance protection of residents from vector-borne diseases. And so in Nigeria, there is paucity of information on how housing type may influence malaria transmission among under five children. And so for this study, we tested the hypothesis that improved housing is not associated with reduction in malaria prevalence among under five children in Nigeria. So for this study, we used a secondary data. So the data was collected by the you know, various body within Nigeria is a national representative data that cuts across the Texas states of, of Nigeria. The country is also divided into um, geopolitical zones. So we have six political zones. Within the political zones, we, have, we also have local governments. Within local governments, we have localities and also the elimination area. So the houses that were selected so, you know, were conducted, were selected based on you know, different, a different multi stage of something. And, um, a probability systematic sampling was used to select 25 households in each of the elimination areas. And so at the end of the day, we have about 330 elimination areas. And a total of 8,020 women that were between age 15 and 49 years of age that were residing permanently in those households at the night prior to the survey were selected by the data originators. So questionnaires were used to obtain information as regards their um, malaria prevention practices. And also women. I'm so sorry, rather children that were under five years within those households that were selected, their blood samples were, were collected and were analyzed using rapid diagnosis tests and also microscopy to test for the presence of malaria parasites in their blood. And so for our variables, the dependent variable was the outcome of the text for, e for each of the random and diagnosis tests and also for microscopy. And our main independent variable was was, was the housing type in which those children live. So housing was classified into two. We have the improved housing and also the unimproved housing, uh, and, the, uh, and the improved and unimproved housing types based on the material with which the houses were built. And so we look, you know, the data organization looks at the, the collected information on the floor, the roof, and the wall for each housing. And so for the flooring materials, you know, improved materials include you know, in houses that has this particular, uh, that has this floor type that are built with cement, ceramic tiles, vinyl, asphalt strips, parapets, and polished wood, and the unimproved include houses that use hat, sand, dung, rudimentary wood planks, palm, bamboo, and others for their floors. And also for the floor materials, we also classified into improved and unimproved. Then also the roofing materials, you know, based on the, the type of materials that they used to and were classified as either improved or non-improved. Then in addition, apart from the floor, the, the, the wall, and also the roof, so houses that, has com that were completely improved for, for the three categories were classified as totally improved. Then we also calculate any house that has maybe one either improved or non-improved was, was categorized as partially improved, and those that have nothing to be improved were known as unimproved housing. So in addition to this, you know, improved housings also include houses that has features that, pre that has closed eaves, you know, that has cranes on their windows and doors to, to prevent vector, um, malaria vectors from coming inside the, the households. So other variables that we're controlled for in our analysis include um, the household wealth, we look at the age of the child, we look at the sex of the child, the mother's education, the place of residence, their region, their location, is it rural or urban? wanted to know if they you know, slept on that long-lasting incestual treatment or ever treatment and also if they had fever in the last two weeks. So our data analysis, we use um, STESA version 14 to analyze our data and the basic descriptive statistics were used to describe the distribution of the material within the variables. We use logistic regression to identify the risk factors you know, that might predispose the children to malaria. Then we also take steps for the presence of other variables we are controlled for at the multi-stage analysis. So we also used the multivariate analysis and three models were used. At the first model, the first model we looked at the relationship between the housing type and the result from the malaria test. At the second model, we, we looked at the relationship between the outcome of the malaria test in addition to if this, you know, the children uses long lasting interest net and ever treated nets. And at the third stage, we introduced other um, independent variables so that we'll be able to know that to be able to, to find out if 
what we are looking at is actually the relationship we'll be looking at is actually what it is. And so these are weighted and signals was evaluated at 5%. The weighting is like is a, an inflation um, factor so that we can extrapolate what we have within the sample to the general population, which is the target population. The data organizers you know, you know, applied for uh, approval and so the study protocol was approved. In our results, in all, a total of 6,991 children were recruited into the survey, and among them, 5,753 and 6,000 6,025 were tested for both RGC and microscopy. And so we find out that the percentage of children that are positive for malaria increased with increase in H, increased with increase in H. So, so many explanations could be given to this. For example, we know that you know, immunoglobulin G can be transferred from mothers even to child during pregnancy. And so that can explain that, can, that can be a factor in, in, in showing, for example, if I show this table to you, that can be a factor in you know, telling us that you know, um, malaria um, infection increases with age. So within age zero to six, you find out there is a reduction in the, um, in the prevalence of malaria and other type because the children are still dependent on their mother and so the antibodies can be transferred to them and so they still enjoy that particular immunity. Apart from that, children within age zero to six most of them are still breastfeeding, and so there can also be trans, you know, trans the transfer of immunoglobulin A, you know, from the breast milk to the to the children. Studies have shown that immunoglobulin A can prevent, can you know, reduce malaria parasite when they, you know, when used in, in vitro. We also find that as males were more prone to malaria than females, people and children in rural areas were more prone than those in, in the urban areas. The one result that also stands out is that you know, children that, that slept under insensitized in mosquito nets you know, had more malaria. You know, I test them, we find more positive among them than people that do not even use, um, they are not using mosquito nets. So, so many um, explanations can also be given to this. It's possible that they may be infected even before their parents put them under the mosquito nets, it's possible that the nets are, have holes, they are proliferated, they have holes, or wrong use of nets. They are also, could also be as a result of a, reduction, a decline in the bioefficacy of those nets. So, so many um, explanations can be given to that. So, if you also look at this table that is showing the relationship between housing characteristics and malaria infection among other five children, you can find that, that you know, children that live in, in, in improved ha housing you know, had lower they had a um, lower prevalence of malaria than those that live in houses that are built with floor or improved floor materials, and that's also explained for the roof materials and also for the, the wall materials. If you also look at houses that had totally improved materials, we find that as malaria prevalence increases, increases with, you know, with a decrease in the, in, the, in, in the material type in which you use in building those houses. At the motivated level of, uh, of analysis, you know, at the first model where we looked at the housing types and the prevalence of malaria, we find out that you know, children that live in houses that when, where they are unimproved, nothing was improved, they have, they have about five times uh, at higher risks of having malaria than those that live in houses were totally improved. At the second model where we introduce other variables like um, sleeping on that, Slept under a virus treated net, sleeping under an LNI, or if their they um, indoor environment was sprayed, we find out that it was still significant. And that shows that you know, neither of the sleeping under a virus treated net, LNI, or spraying the walls you know, has any you know, impact on the relationship that we have, that we observe between non improved housing and malaria. And also at the third level, we introduce all other variables, though there was a reduction in the hearts of having malaria, but we can still find that that is more than one, and so the relationship is still, is still, is still there. So in conclusion, I want to say that non-improved housing predicted malaria infection among other five in Nigeria based on our, our findings. Improved housing is a promising means to support a more integrated and sustainable approach to malaria prevention. So this can be used in conjunction with other control measures that have been existing before now. Then education of the populace on the role of improved housing 
on malaria protection and empowerment of the public will also go a long way in reducing the current burden of, uh, of infection that we have among other five in Nigeria. Some unanswered questions that need to maybe further um, research is that what is the most eff efficient way to scale up housing interventions so at least everybody can buy into this. Then second point is how can existing le legislation on housing be reviewed or enforced to influence the design of housing? And the third one is how does the cost of building improve housing compare with the cost of regular housing? Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, I was particularly pleased to see that uh, you reference Pinder et al. 2016, so this is a publication that comes from the unit of MRC Unit de Gambia, and actually the author is here in the room. <laughs> so the, the, you know, the unit is, has done quite a lot of work on housing and malaria. Um, but anyway, we have time for one question. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Professor Sidatia from the University of the Gambia. I have, I think, uh, one maximum of three questions, short ones. The first one on the prevalence of malaria in Africa, you showed Nigeria being the dominant, 24%. Was that per capita or just at the uh, national level? Because there's a difference between the two. Uh, if you can, yeah. You say it's 24 percent Nigeria. Is that per capita, or is that uh, nationwide? Per capita meaning uh, per number of people in Nigeria affected by malaria. Is that 24 percent, or on average, countrywide? Because there's a difference between the two. I'll give you one example. Okay. If you look at emissions of greenhouse gases worldwide, globally, China is number one, has highest. But if you look at per capita, United States is number one. Meaning, the more people you have, the higher the population, the, um, the lower the capita emissions is. Is that the same case in Nigeria for this one? And two, okay. you said uh, malaria infection, if you compare males under five to females under five, the, is higher in, in, in your numbers, I think. It's higher among the males. Was that statistically significant or not? And also, if we compare improved and unimproved housing, malaria, you say it's lower, malaria infection is lower under improved housing. But is that also statistically significant if we compare the improved and unimproved housing? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for, um, for your um, contribution and also the, uh, the the questions. I want to start with the, the last two. You know, if you can look at this particular table, you can see that it's um, it's significant. The relationship, it's um, it's significant. Let me show you this. Yes, even when we control for other factors in model two and also model three, even the presence of other independent variables like sleeping under long-lasting insect treated nets, slept under ever treated nets, and indoor respiratory spring, it was still no, very significant. And the people that lived on in the houses that were totally unimproved, they have a, a heart of about they are five about five times higher at the risk of having malaria than those that live in partially and in, in, in partially improved housing. Then also the second one, that males and females, is also significant. If you look at at this. 0 0.03, no, it's not significant. It's not, it's, it's not significant, but you can, you can see there that you know, males had higher. The difference is not too much, 4.6 to 4.4, 4.42 4 is not significant, but at least it shows that may you know, have higher risk of having malaria than, than this. For the figure you talked about, I didn't think about that, but what the figure was trying to show, it's you know, looking at you know, said a percentage of estimated deaths for 21 countries for 2018, and so I think they looked at the past, the the percentage, the number of persons, the proportion of persons that have malaria in those countries, and for it for 21 countries, and among them, Nigeria is responsible for 25 percent of the total 5 percent of the global malaria deaths. I'm not sure if it is so. Um, if if per I capita yes, go ahead. Okay, I said I'm not sure if it is um, per capita or. The, the general population was this for 21 countries and Nigeria is responsible for the 85 percent 
Nigeria is responsible for 24 percent among them. Okay, thank you. J just to complement um, uh, the answer, uh, so this is from the uh, Malaria World Report. So if you look at the title, this is a percentage of estimated deaths. So globally, in the world, there is an estimation of malaria deaths, and of these, 24 percent are from Nigeria, right? So of all the deaths in the world, 24 for malaria, 24 percent are in uh, in Nigeria. In actual fact, you have the uh, there are 10 countries in Africa that actually have the 70 percent burden in terms of global burden in terms of deaths and also clinical cases. But these are absolute numbers. So it's a percentage of absolute numbers, right? So, uh, uh, and for the, I think one thing that we need to be careful is that you look at the structure of the housing, you know, uh, in terms of materials used. Uh, but these, the things about your improved, non-improved, the partial improved, it, it can be really an uh, indicator of socioeconomic status, uh, not necessarily due to the structure of the house, right? And so, uh, obviously, poorer people are more at risk. So it may show that more than really the structure of the house. Uh, but I think it's very interesting. And also, the other comment is that it's an area of very high transmission, because if you have 50% or more, I don't remember now what it is, Prevalence by microscopy means that almost everybody is infected if you do molecular, molecular analysis. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I go to Mike. I don't know why, but we go to the next uh, uh, presentation. <laughs> uh, so the next speaker is Ramba Eli, uh, who is going to talk about special, uh, on special disparities in malaria transmission in the health district of Nanoro, Burkina Faso. I suspect that he's coming from the Clinical Research Unit in Nanoro, headed by my friend Ali Dutinto. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Welcome. So thank you. My name is Ramba Eli. I'm from Burkina Faso in the, in the clinical research unit of Nanoro. I'm going to present you the spatial disparities in malaria transmission in the health district of Nanoro as the following plan. An introduction, objective, method, result, a discussion point and conclusion. You can say that in Burkina Faso, climate is characterized the last 50 years by a shift of isolate from north to south. Then analysis of parameters, of climatic parameters during the last, this last 50 years showed a significant change in annual rainfall and temperature across the country and a decrease of water resources in the country. The overcome of this situation is the, in, is the intervention of government to implement, to boost uh, the agricultural production and creation intensive production and economic growth pull around man-made dam uh, across the country. Then the construction of the dam of Sum, which is located in one Oh, two kilometers of in the northwest of the Ouagadougou, of Ouagadougou contribute to strengthen the resilience of population in order to reduce the vulnerability to climate change. But, however, this creates some pressure of population resulting in change in dynamics and water related and waterborne diseases like schizomiasis, malaria, dengue, diarrhea, and etc. The morbidity among the health district of Nanoro is about 59%, but around the dam of Sum, here is 60%, but it is 62%. So uh, we know that in endemic area like Nanoro, uh, we can observe significant difference 
at in transmission of malaria at different level, the level of villages, the level of houses, and more. In this context, uh, we need to investigate more spatial components which can contribute to increase the risk of malaria around the dam of Sum. So our objective are to identify geographic factors involved in the distribution of malaria around the dam of Sum, and then analyze the correlation between these factors and the risk of malaria. You can see in the map that Nanoro, Nanoro is located in 84 kilometers in the northwest of Ouagadougou. We selected two villages, the village of Sum and the village of Nazwanga. Uh, the particularity is that, is that uh, in this place, there are several, there is the presence of several water res reservoirs, so potential lava jet. Our methodology, we have done an examination of consulting register of health facilities. We collected case of malaria. We link the data collected in these health facilities and the data collected in the health facility and in the health and demographical surveillance system. Then we link the two data and find information uh, and localize each household consulting in the health facility for malaria. Then we do a survey with three 30 households. We would interview with racial persons like health and agricultural workers. We as all, all, almost, we have geographical, geographic positioning and observation. Then uh, the data analysis required statistic, correlation with the test of fissure and thematic maps. <coughs> the age pyramid in Nanoro show a largest proportion of young people and women. We have a wide base with a crude birth in 36 per, per thousand. We can see that we have a significant male immigration in neighboring country uh, in our context it is in Cote d'Ivoire. So the distribution of case in the map in, an, in Nazwanga and in Tsu show a predominance of case near the rivers in Nazwanga, but in Su at Sum, we saw a predominance of case in distant area uh, in that in, in this village. So the test of Fisher uh, show a, an associate a, a relationship with malaria transmission when people use mosquitoes nets and when they use uh, material like uh, call it banco, I think it dirt floor for the construction of their household or their compound. So like as, as I say, the banco is the main build material used. 93% uh, of the population use it in the two villages and more than 50% use it for the construction of the floor. We consider a low use of mosquitoes net, 53%, despite, despite a great ownership. We see that in the two villages, more than 90% of population uh, own mosquitoes net. 80% of households use the concession, the compound as breeding seat in, in Nazwanga. In Sum, they sit are out of courtyard for 60%. More than 80% of us all dump their wastewater in the street in Nazwanga, and 57%, however, do it inside the courtyard at Sum. One important information is that more than half of households 
have mobile phone and radio in our area. So in discussion, you see that, you see a night prevalence in household bills in Banco. Uh, they use uh, this material for the wall, the floor, and the roof. That provides better place for the rest of mosquitoes. We see also a low occurrence in us all using mosquitoes net. So we need to increase sensitization, especially since there, are, there is a strong ownership uh, with, uh, of radios and phone. The street is used as a spillway site of wastewater and sewage that can create stagnation of water in depression and lava jet of mosquitoes. We saw high prevalence of water, especially in rainy periods. So mosquitoes move to the nearest compound to provide their blood meal. We see also a predominance of cases in distant, in remote areas. We can mention the influence of other factors like paddles, building materials, mosquitoes net use, and etc. We know that in Burkina Faso, uh, we have the common species is the Anophel Gambier. So these species uh, have a great geographic dispersion, a geographic dispersion. To conclude, we can say that our study observed difference between lifestyle and practice in households of the village of Nazwanga and Sum. That difference impacts the dynamic of transmission of malaria around the dam of Sum. And uh, a good characteristic of sociodemographic and environmental profile could allow better understanding of malaria transmission for a better development of st strategy and intervention in the fight against malaria. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation. Uh, I think Banco is mud and uh, straw, right? Banco... And straw, la paille. Okay. No? What is it? A coutia, coutia, dirt, dirt flows. Uh, like la terre battue, je sais pas comment dire ça. La terre battue, d'accord, fin. Okay. Okay. Okay, and one time for one question. No question? Okay, because we are a bit late. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. And I'm going to ask uh, the last speaker to come, Latifatu Alassan Abubakar, uh, who is going to talk a very unusual um, topic of uh, impact of elevated lead levels on the risk of malaria anemia in children mining areas in Ghana. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm Latif Fatou Al Hassan from the Kintampo Health Research Center, Ghana. That's the central Ghana. On behalf of uh, the team, I'm presenting on the topic uh, the impact of elevated lead levels, ELL for short, on the risk of anemia and malaria among children living in uh, a mining area in Ghana called the Ahafo area. Before I start, I must emphasize that this work is part of a bigger study that was conducted in the year 2006, 2007, then again in the year 2012 uh, to establish a uh, baseline reference values uh, data for future comparison prior to the start of activity by a mining group in Ghana known as uh, the New Months Gold Ghana Limited. Lead, due to its uh, good properties such as malleability, 
high density, poor electrical conductivity has been used extensively in our society today. Due to this, it has spread contamination to areas we consider isolated. Over the years, lead has been introduced into the environment through emission from mining sources, through the use of uh, leaded petrochemicals, even unexpected sources such as uh, electronic waste, and then uh, dolls in our makeups, lipstick, among others. Over the years, as, uh, the use of leaded petrochemicals phased out. Mining alone produced about uh, 3 million tons of lead into the environment over the last five centuries. So breathing air that contains lead, eating food that contains lead, can lead to the damage of uh, vital organs of the body, such as the kidney. It is in this regard that the World Health Organization identified lead as one of the top 10 chemicals of uh, major public health concern. The Center of Disease Control has stated that lead levels above five microgram per deciliter is considered elevated. So many studies have come out with the fact that these elevated lead levels, or ELL, are associated with anemia due to a destruction of the iron heme complex due to selective inhibition. Again, so many stud studies have come out with the fact that uh, malaria and uh, lead also, elevated lead levels overlap geographically. Yet others are saying that they don't only overlap, but they have important consequence on the health of our children since they have ineffective mechanism for the excretion of this metal as compared to adults. In Ghana, mining uh, accounts for more than 9.1% uh, of the country's gross domestic product. So despite this harmful effect of lead, uh, we don't have enough data especially in our part of Africa, where uh, the, uh, West Africa, where the, the disease burden is dominated by malaria and anemia. Data from this study will therefore help in uh, narrowing this knowledge gap. The study sought to estimate the prevalence of elevated lead levels at two different time points and then to also document the association between elevated lead level, malaria or anemia, among these children. So as I've said, this, um, one of the 16 uh, uh, geographical divisions of Ghana include uh, the Ahafo region. It used to be part of a bigger brown Ahafo region, but so the study area falls within this Ahavu region, located in the central part of Ghana. So there's a new Mount Ghana group located in one of the districts. So we have the Asutifi North and South districts, and then the Tano North and South districts. This is where the study took place. As I said earlier, this was a cross-sectional study in 2006-2007 to ascertain the baseline characteristics of malaria anemia, elevated lead level, and other socio-demographic characteristics prior to the start of uh, activities by the new Mount Ghana Limited. So these data served as the baseline indices for future comparison. In the year 2012, when the mining activity had already started, a follow-up study was conducted on the prevalence of these same characteristics. So ethical approval was sought from the Kintampo Health Research Center Ethics Committee. So we also sought permission from the chiefs, opinion leaders in the study areas, as well as uh, the district health uh, directorates. 
And then last but not the least, informed consent was sought from parents or the legally accepted representatives of these study participants. So uh, in the lab, uh, malaria and, uh, determination was done, as well as lead and then uh, anemia. So you, the lead was done using the lead canalizer too, then the HEMOQ201 plus for elevated lead level, uh, for hemoglobin. In all these, strict quality control measures were taken. So statistically, data was uh, doubly entered on the Microsoft Assess version 14, and then the distribution of lead was assessed and then categorized into two. We have elevated lead levels, that was defined as lead levels greater than five micrograms per deciliter or low otherwise, and then lead poison, that was uh, defined as lead levels greater than 10 micrograms per deciliter or low otherwise. So univariate analysis was performed to establish the association between ELL with these characteristics. So this was uh, the cohort characteristics. So in the year 2006, we recruited a total of 1,646. In 2012, uh, this, it was 872. And then, so the male were dominating in both years. For the household size, um, all our majority of our participants were in a household that were about, that had more than five persons per household. Malaria prevalence in uh, two OSIS was um, 22.6. Anemia prevalence was uh, 53 in two OSIS. In 2012, anemia was 35.6, and then malaria in the same year, two OSIS, was 26.2. 72. So before this resource, I must again emphasize that uh, after uh, the 2006 2012 study, the uh, report of the survey was uh, given to the Ghana Health Service and then the New Mont Ghana Gold Limited. Uh, so with this report, interventions such as uh, the provision of portable drinking water and then uh, most, uh, malaria control uh, measures were undertaken before uh, uh, the new month started its activity. So in the year 20, uh, 2012, uh, malaria was more prevalent than the uh, first time point, and then anemia less than the first time point. So when it comes to elevated level, it decreased drastically from uh, two OSS. That was from 43.4 to 22.7 in 2012. On factors associated with uh, ELL, we came out with the fact that uh, children with uh, malaria parasite count greater than 5,000 parasites per microliter of blood were 32% more likely to get elevated lead level. This was, however, not significant. For anemia, children were, with anemia were 19% more likely to get elevated lead level with a p-value of 0 0.043, which was quite significant. In conclusion, the prevalence of elevated lead level at the two time points in the study area was more than 20%. There was, however, a weak evidence to support the association between these three parameters. I would like to thank the director, staff of Kintapo of Research Center, Ghana Health Service, New Mount Ghana Gold Limited, participants as well as their parents, and then organizing committee for the immense support Thank you very much. Thank you um, for this interesting talk. Uh, I mean, my first impression is lead, 
high elevated lead level are very high in this group of children, even in 2006. Uh, anyway, one or two questions maximum. Is there any question? The children with elevated lead levels, were they offered any treatment? Were they elevated lead level? Yeah. For the children? Yes, were they offered any treatment? Okay, so as uh, we, we know, for malaria, as part of the study, all those who had malaria, they were clinicians to, uh, to, to, to check on them for malaria and anemia. And then we know for lead poison, the only method for lead treatment is the chelating method, <laughs> maybe which even though ethically we're supposed to do, uh, but because of its expensive nature, we couldn't do that. Okay, last question. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I wanted to ask with regards to your outcome, um, because um, you were, was it malaria or was it anemia? And then again, did you adjust it for some confounding? Because looking at your logistic regression analysis, there was no um, indication of how many variables were adjusted in the model to understand actually what were uh, some of the uh, confounders. And again, if you can just tell us the outcome. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, we adjusted for several variables, such as uh, the age, sex, and then others. But for the sake of space and then time, I couldn't uh, add a map to the slide. Thank you, but you can link up for more details. Okay, but so there is one thing I don't understand. Why the lead poisoning was higher in 2006? Because I think you said that the structural lead was started afterwards. Is that correct or? Yes, yes, please. So before I started uh, giving out the results, I also emphasized that there were several interventions after two oses. So the intervention included the provision of potable water and then malaria uh, f uh, treatment and uh, among other, other things. But before they were... the mining activity started, based on our report in 2006. But before 2006, there was no structure of lead mining? Mm, no, there wasn't mining okay. before 2006. They started the activity somewhere in the year 20, uh, 2008, 2009. So there was more po no. lead poisoning before the mining than afterwards. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, please. Okay, which is, okay, fine. <laughs> Good, thank you very much. So we finished this, this uh, sec session. Um, we have tea break outside. Uh, we are 15 minutes late uh, according to the schedule. So I don't know if I can ask you to come here at 11.35, instead of have 20 minutes instead of 30. Uh, and so we have a session with Chair Professor Greg Jenkins and Dr. Anna Bonnell, and invited speaker Isuf Traore. So please come back here at 11.35, sorry, yeah, thank you.